Hello everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. Thank you for another day, Lord. Thank you that you're in complete control of every situation and every circumstance in our life, Lord. You promised us you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, you go with us all the way even unto the end of the world. And Father, I pray that uh, for today's Sunday school class, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my Lord, my Savior, and my Redeemer. For we ask it in Jesus' matchless name. And the church said, Amen. All right. Um, here's a lesson for May the 24th, 2020, and uh, the title of the lesson is, Do the Right Thing, Call to, work, uh, to God's Work of Justice, Amen? Call to do God's Work of Justice, Amen? And here's the key verse. It says uh, uh, from Jeremiah 22 and 3, from the King James Version, it says, Do not wrong, do no violence to the stranger. You know, the NIV says to the foreigner. Uh, one version says the alien. Uh, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. Jeremiah 22 and 3. Amen? Alright. So, uh, here are our lesson names. Uh, number one, we need to understand that the covenant relationship between God and God's people requires justice. Amen? Uh, number two, repent for injustice. And seek to deliver the oppressed. Amen? There's a, ever a time where we need to repent. It is now. Amen? And then number three. Become active agents of deliverance for the oppressed. Hallelujah. Alright. As children and youth... How did we avoid or delay disi disciplinary action from our parents? Primarily by being obedient. That is by doing the right thing. We would steer clear of punishment. If you were like me, you attempted to avoid the wrath of a big mama by making sure you did what you were told when you were told. And how you were told to do it. Amen. Um, and that brings to my mind. Uh, that uh, many times when we go through trials and difficulties in our life. It is a test. And if we fail the test. We have to keep on taking the test. Over and over and over again until we pass it. So I don't want to do that. I want to take it the first time and I want to pass the test. Amen? How about you? All right? So let's continue. If you were like me, you attempted to avoid the wrath of a big mama by making sure you did what you were told when you were old, when you were told, and how you were told to do it. The reward for doing the right thing in my home was the establishment of a trusting relationship between my parents and me. I was entrusted uh, with more responsibility and received more privileges because of my choice to obey the standards set in my home. As children of God, the situation is the same. His expectation is that we do the right thing at all, at all times. He has provided the rule book that governs our relationship with Him. 
and he and expects us to follow it obediently and he expects us to follow it obediently deliberately refusing to do the right thing in God's family results in unpleasant discipline a review of the historical relationship between God and Israel reveals this to be true he chose them gave them the requirements of family membership and blessed them with his presence, his provision and protection. To their detriment, they chose to do wrong rather than do right according to the standards he gave them. Like a good parent, he kept reminding them of their covenant requirements and offering the opportunity to repent and do the right thing. Isn't that awesome that God is so long-suffering that He gives us chance after chance after chance to make it right. God used Jeremiah as Judah's last chance messenger during the final siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army. He offered Judah's sitting king, officials, and the people the choice of doing the right thing. Thing by acting with justice and righteousness to mitigate his wrath, preserve David's royal house, and prevent the total destruction of the city. Wow! All right, so let's look at the uh, biblical context for all this. All right, um, let's look at the biblical context. Uh, Chapter 22 continues God's warnings concerning Jeremiah's no, concerning Jerusalem's fall. It was in the preceding chapters verses 11 through 14 the spiritual conditions of the city were parallel to those that Jesus observed centuries later during his earthly ministry. See Matthew 23:37 through 39. In chapter 21, Zedekiah sent messengers to Jeremiah. Now God was sending Jeremiah to him, his officials and the people who were in the palace with a message that offered a way to preserve the royal dynasty and avoid the total destruction of the palace and the city of Jerusalem. Amen? Alright. So, Let's look at the analysis of the biblical text. Point number one is the choice is yours. Jeremiah 21, 1 through 5. Point number two is a dire prediction. Jeremiah 22, 6 through 10. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Amen. All right, so let's look at the first point, the choice is yours, Jeremiah 22, 1 through 5. Thus saith the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sitteth upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, Execute e judgment and righteousness and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor and do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, Neither shed innocent blood in this place. For if he do this thing, indeed, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house kings sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, he and his servants and his people, 
But if ye will not hear these words, I swear by myself, said the Lord, that the house shall become a desolation. Wow. Wow. The choice is yours. Amen? All right. So while the Babylonians lay the final siege to Jerusalem and defeat was certain, God sent Jeremiah down to the palace of the king of Judah. Verse 1. Jeremiah was instructed to address the king, officials, and people who were in the precincts of the royal palace. He was to tell them what they needed to do to prevent the removal of the royal house and the total destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 3. God demanded that they do justice and righteousness and deliver those robbed by their oppressors. Doing justice and righteousness would be further seen in their refusal to mistreat or to do violence to strangers, foreigners. Aha! Orphans and widows among them and refusal to shed innocent blood. This demand specifically referenced King Jehoiakim, who is guilty of these injustice, injustices for the purpose of building a magnificent palace for himself. Aha! See? And isn't that what's going on in the church today? I'm talking about the church in general. It's about building these magnificent edifices. Of course, it's to God, for God, you know. And then uh, there are multiplied resources coming into the house of God, but you never know where they disappear. <laughs> ah, wow. Wow. Uh, and so there's a lot of injustice going on. You know, it's all about money. <laughs> Multiple streams of income. Ah, how do you double your worth, your financial worth? It's all about that. <laughs> and people are sitting there and just swallowing this hook, line, and sinker. If these commands were obeyed, then the king would expect continued blessings, and David's dynasty would continue as God had promised. Verse 4. God swore by himself in view of the stipulations of his covenant with David that refusal to obey these demands would cause the disillusion of the family of David as rulers of his people. Mm. God always provides people a choice and a chance to obey his standards based on what has been stipulated in his word. By doing the right thing, he's obligated to bless according to what he has said he will do. By contrast, choosing to do the wrong thing would trigger his obligation to maintain his integrity to his word by following through with the consequences he has determined for disobedience. Jeremiah's message calling for doing justice and righteousness is relevant and timely for God's people today. There is blatant social injustice towards those who are considered aliens in our country and towards the disenfranchised. As we identify these injustices in our communities, we are called and challenged to address them and become agents of comfort and deliverance 
of the oppressed among us. Amen? We are supposed to be the agents of change. We're supposed to help the oppressed and the needy. You know? And the poor. And, and, and the moment you start talking about this, you know, people say, Oh, you're talking about a spirit of poverty. No, no, no. I, that's not what I'm talking about. Jesus said, I'll provide all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And it's need and not greed. We're talking about greed and covetousness here. So don't 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 twist this thing around. Okay? And 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 we're not Catholics, so <laughs> we're not taking no vows of poverty. Where did that come from? You know, moment you talk about <laughs> <laughs> covetousness they you know they say wow you know it's a spirit of poverty you're talking about you know and all this kind of nonsense that's going on you know people sit there and listen to it Jeremiah's message calling for doing justice and righteousness is relevant timely for God's people today there is blatant social injustice toward those who are considered aliens in our country and towards the disenfranchised. As we identify these injustices in our community, we are called and challenged to address them and become agents of comfort and deliverance of the oppressed among us. Amen? We are the ones, as a church, we should be doing all these stuff, all these things. Well, we, we do it, but it's just a teeny little bit. Amen. The rest, we don't know where it goes. But. Suffice to say, you can trust me. Anyway. What do you think? God commanded Jeremiah's audience to do justice and righteousness. How can we engage in more doing than talking about the need for social justice and equity in our local communities? You know, we need to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Amen? We need to do more things for the poor, like Matthew 25. You know, things like that. Um, we need to reach out to the poverty-stricken areas and provide people with relief. And we do do that to, to a certain extent, but not to the extent that we should be doing. Amen? So, all right, so, so that's what we need to do. We need to do more of the above. Amen? More of the above. We need to be involved more in missions work. Foreign missions, domestic missions, supporting missionaries, and things of that sort. Amen? All right, let's go on. Point number two, a dire prediction. Jeremiah 22, 6 through 10. For thus saith the Lord unto the king's house of Judah, Thou art Gilead unto me, and the head of Lebanon, yet surely I will make thee a wilderness, and cities which are not inhabited. I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. And many nations shall pass by the city, and they shall say every man to his neighbor, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this great city? Then they shall answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God, and worshipped other gods, and served them. Weep ye not for the dead, neither bemoan him, but weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor see his, his native country. And, you know, when you read scriptures like that, I bet you there are people that are saying, come on, get off your high horse, Brother Percy, you know. 
Come on. You know, we, we're not idol worshippers, you know. We don't have a pot by a bellied Buddha in our house, you know. We don't do things like that. <laughs> that that's that's all the those heathen people that do it. <laughs> we just worship our possessions. <laughs> Our cars, our houses, our, you know, food. <laughs> uh, money, which is covetousness. You know, money is our God. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to come on so strong. You know. Uh, you got to humor, you got to humor old guys a little bit, you know. So the failure to receive the support of those to whom one ministers can be hurtful and for the less spiritually mature a reason to quit or grow slack. What can be more hurtful is not having the support of those among you among your most personal and intimate relationship. You know, all you got to do is uh, call a prayer meeting. Nobody will show up. <laughs> you call a men's meeting, <laughs> very few show up. Unless, of course, you promise them breakfast. Then some more will show up. You wonder if they're coming for the food or if they're coming for the food of God's word. Amen. The nation of Israel had the privilege of being in an intimate relationship with God. They were privileged to have access to His abiding presence, provision, protection and power. Their continued rebellion lead, led to a break in fellowship between them. This disappointed and grieved God, although He loved them as His unique possession. His faithfulness to His Word required that they were severely disciplined. Did you hear that? Let me repeat that. Their continued rebellion led to a break in fellowship between them. This disappointed and grieved God, although He loved them as His unique possession, His faithfulness to His word required that they be severely disciplined. God is a kind and loving God, a compassionate God, but He's also a just God. You got to remember that, we can't forget that. Jerusalem was His choice as a city for His presence to dwell among them. The palace and the temple were beautiful to him, yet as dear to him as they were. He was not going to relent in bringing about that total destruction because of the sins of the people. Oh God! The Babylonians set apart by God would destroy their palaces and great houses of fine cedar by cutting them up, throwing them into the fire. And burning them. Oh God. Sometimes God will use your enemies against you. If your enemy becomes strong against you. It's a, it might be a sign that you're not being obedient to God. Those who observed the catastrophic destruction of Jerusalem would ask, answer their own questions of why the God of Judah had orchestrated this disaster. There's some people even today, they're saying, why? You know, why is God doing all this stuff, you know? We're the most Christian nation on the face of this earth. You know, we've got TV programs, radio programs, podcasts, you name it, we've got it. We've got Bible translations and different forms and, 
you know, all kinds of uh, Bibles on tapes, audio Bibles. You can have the Bible on your cell phone. We're the most religious people in the world. And why this, God? It was all religion, no relationship, very little relationship. Amen? And in fact, knowing about the things of God makes us more responsible and we will receive the stricter judgment. God forbid. Even they would know that it was because Judah had forsaken their covenant and committed the sin of idolatry. God's people today must constantly be aware that a hostile world watches our every move and attitude. It is non-negotiable that if we are to be effective witnesses, we must recognize that we are to be in the world, but not of it. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. To prove what is the good, the perfect, and the acceptable will of God. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. We're being squeezed. Our obedience becomes a source of blessing for ourselves and others rather than focus on building magnificent edifices of fine cedar that will one day perish. Our focus must be on building lives of lasting integrity. Integrity is no longer in our vocabulary anymore. You know, we don't talk about integrity. What, what's, what's, what's integrity, you know? Hey, everybody's doing it. <laughs> huh? Get with it, man. Get with it. Huh? You crotchety old man. Get with it. <laughs> the closing verses, verse 10 and verses 11 through 12, refer to Shalom, Jehoahaz, a son of Josiah, who succeeded him after he was killed by Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt. Shalom's reign lasted only three months before he was deposed by Necho. Weep not for the dead, here refers to Josiah. Instead of continuing to mourn his death before he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah instructs the people to mourn for his son Shalom, who had gone into captivity in Egypt. Because he would die there and never see his homeland again. Oh God, oh God. Although Josiah's death may have appeared premature, he was spared the agony of seeing his people, the temp their city and the temple, destroyed by the Babylonians. Some among Jeremiah's audience would experience Shalom's fate. Therefore, their weeping should have been for the living who would face God's irreversible judgment. Can I pause over here? You know, the, the, the greatest thing that, uh, that, that I fear is, is for our children and our children's children, our grandchildren. Have we become so callous? That we don't even care about the future of our progeny. Of our children and our children's children. Are we so hard hearted? That we're going to do what we're going to do. Although it's going to cost our children and our grandchildren a tremendous amount. Oh God help us. Have mercy on us Lord. Have mercy on me. Lost humankind is more to be mourned for the fate of waiting the unrepentant than those who die in the Lord. Divine judgment is certain for all, 
the saved and the unsaved, all will stand before God and be righteously judged according to their deeds. The uncertainty of when this will occur should motivate God's people to strive to follow God's way and do the right thing. Equally as urgent is the need to show concern for the lost by proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to them before it is everlastingly too late. What specific evidence reveals that God's people have not forsaken their covenant responsibilities? If after when we go back to church after this COVID-19, if things do not return back to the usual, then we can know that God's people have not forsaken their covenant responsibilities. That's what I feel. If we don't go, to go back to our comfort zones, to our social clubs, And things of that nature, you know, come into the house of the Lord and we so-called worship Him. Then we live like the devil from Monday to Saturday. That ain't going to work. You, you can't ride the fence. We have to go all out for God. God is still calling His people to do the right thing and act with justice and righteousness because these qualities are attributes of His divine character. There are hurting people all around us who need to see these aspects of His character demonstrated in our daily lives and context with them. We need to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit to the people around us so they can see God in us. You know, as someone rightly said that don't curse the darkness, light a candle. Because when things are so dark, even a small spark can light up a whole big dark room. Doing the right thing from God's perspective is not limited to certain areas of our lives. This week, identify an area of your daily walk in which you need to be more consistently obedient. Acknowledge your favor, your failure or laxity in this area and commit to becoming obedient in following God's standard for it. Amen. Oh Lord, help us to witness more to people around us, Lord. Help us to meet more of their need. Father, please, whatsoever we do unto the least of these, you've done it unto you, is what the Bible says. And whatsoever we don't do unto the least of these, we have not done it unto 